Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Newcastle Fast FM here with Dr. Abdul Haq on the Baker broadcast on a beautiful evening, inshallah ta'ala. All those whom you hold dear to you, inshallah. It is a great pleasure of a... Well, yes, it's a privilege. I think it's a privilege for us to be here, uh, myself and Dr. Abdul Haq, to be able to sit here and to be able to talk to you about these things. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been touching upon some very serious issues that are affecting our community and due to whatever reasons are being ignored, overlooked and avoided. And these things are things that need to be addressed. And as we know, and we've seen time and time again, when they are not addressed where at the root, they will continue to rise up and show in our society and community in different ways. Now, over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about domestic violence specifically. Two weeks ago, we spoke about the plight of our sisters and the horrendous scenarios that some of our sisters have experienced and sadly are still experiencing. Last week, we talked about, in the very small minority that it does happen to, is the violence against men and sometimes how situations are manipulated and that people's rights are completely stripped away from them without any true and just cause for it to happen. This week, inshallah, we want to continue this discussion and firstly and foremostly, I want to apologize for our tardiness this evening. That is completely my fault due to technical issues on my side, but I thank all of you for joining us again Assalamu alaikum to all of you, Sister Shamma, Sister Sabna, Shabnam, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm missing a few of you, but inshallah, I will continue to give my salams to you, Sister Yasmin, Jazakul Khair, wa alaikum salam, wa barakatuh. And I want to continue this vein of discussion about the realities of what is going on in our society, what our deen actually says, and why we're not actually confronting that which needs to be dealt with in order that we can live a life which is true to what our faith is about. And that is holding true to Allah as the one and sole creator of all things that exist. And that his messenger Muhammad وسلم, brought his final message for us, for me and for you to follow upon, to remain truthful upon, to hold true until that day when inshallah our reward will be the best of rewards for our eternal life. And on that introduction inshallah, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our, our guest, our co-host, Dr. Abdul Haq, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And yes, sir, wa alaikum salam to our brothers and sisters, Sister Sabrina, who just come up. And thank you for the introduction there, um, Wajid. I think that the last two weeks, I want to say jazakumullah khair to the sisters, particularly who have been contacting me um, following these shows. Um, who I have been having some lengthy discussions with and who have been opening up about some of the things that they're enduring and others they know who are enduring. And as I said two weeks ago, we will keep bringing this. Today's subject, as um, will be highlighted, is, called, uh, is about the convert conundrum between cultures. Because as converts, many of us, Wajid, come to the Dean, leaving a particular culture and even leaving loved ones behind who either have abandoned us, ostracized, ostracized us um, and haven't understood and even thought that we were selling out particular cultures. And we've embraced a religion based upon what we know of that deen, the universality of that deen, the truth of that deen. And we therefore hold those co-religionists to a higher standard, expecting that we're going to find inclusivity, embracing, and love that we that replaces and um, overrides and is more comprehensive than those emotional ties that we had before we embraced or reverted to the Dean. And often, more often than not, we are horrified at what we experience to such mm. an extent that it leaves many of us questioning 
have we embraced the right religion? And as that famous saying goes, if we were to look at the Muslims, we probably may never have embraced Islam, but we actually looked at Islam and it was the reality and the truth of the religion that we followed and, and uh, embraced. And that has maintained our um, belief system or adherence to the truth. But you see often that Muslims are divorced from Islam in their practices, in the way they deal with co-religionists, in the way that some of us are taken advantage of um, because of our naivety. And during this particular um, episode, I will refer to the frameworks that I developed in my PhD studies and which were um, formed the very first part of the Baker broadcast that we did throughout Ramadan. We looked at each stage, yeah. we looked at each four of the four stages. So I'll highlight those now for those who may be unfamiliar with, with my work. And it's something that I looked at converts and I applied to myself, but it's something that's there in conversion theory across different faiths as well. And the four stages, if Hassan can put up the very first basic framework, um, the one before that, Hassan, please. Um, this is the more detailed yeah. one, which I'll explain. And this is, uh, this is like you said, we, we discussed this at, uh, at some length uh, during Ramadan, because we That's were exploring right, yes. the, the foundations of faith, and we were going it's, through exactly. the journey that we all sort of went through, um, especially, as you said, for people who come return to the deen in that sense, the, the, the journey that these people go through, inshallah. Right. So, um, Hassan, if you can put up that one, is the, the, the last one that you put up? Yes. Yeah. So you'll see, this, this applies to uh, Muslims who are returning to the faith as well, but you have that first stage, the founding phase of conversion. And that's a very idealistic um, stage of development. It's a cognitive opening to a new reality, um, uh, mainly and primarily on this occasion, Islam. And then you move as you are learning and you have this zeal for this new faith to the youthful phase, which is a very formative stage. Um, again, very idealistic, where the individual is obtaining information, believing it to be knowledge, but they're not able to contextualize that particular information as yet. So they're practicing, they may come across as overzealous, they may isolate themselves from wider society, they may feel that they are holier than thou and want to preach to the world and change everyone. They want to practice everything that they're reading um, and try and emulate the early companions in that instance before realizing that the context of their learning has been in abstract and that they have not really understood the tenets of the religion um, uh, essentially until they grow, they may marry, they may travel to other lands, they may start actualizing the practice of their faith, moving them onto the adult phase, which is a formative foundational stage, um, sorry, but they also reflect on their earlier understandings and they modify some of those idealistic youthful stages of development. As they grow, as they have more, have children of their own, as they understand the religion better, they move to that final mature stage or phase, which is again, even more reflective, but they're more settled in their practice. And we see that those who fall or succumb to extremism are usually at the founding phase and the youthful phase. We see that those who are taken advantage of are usually at those earlier two stages. We see that the predators among our communities those who are seeking out vulnerable young women, idealistic sisters who are ready to do everything, sacrifice for the deen, and have a very, um, uh, I'd say, narrow understanding of marriage in that instance. They, the predators usually look for sisters who are at these first two stages. Hassan, if you want to remove that now, so we could, I hope that that um, explanation has helped in that, and, de and that illustration helps um, to, to form the basis of what we will be yeah. discussing. So, yeah. for example, uh, Wajid, what, what I will say is this, we come into the Muslim community, okay? Mm. We come in with all this expectation, all this love, all this hope, this zeal, and this vulnerability 
And I want to ask you this. I'm not saying you have the answer, but I'm asking you this as a South Asian, part of the predominant Muslim community in the UK. Why then are we not embraced except for the element of tokenism, which wanes, which fades, and then we are left in a no man's land in times of Eid, in times of celebration, in times of need, in times of marriage where you're, we will look for someone, the brother will look for a Pakistani sister or, or, or a South Asian sister because he expects that her culture and her background about the religion is such that he can learn from her. The sister may marry a um, South Asian male only to be looked down upon by family members. We know how attached you are to your mothers. And we all know the story, Muslim or non-Muslim, about the mother-in-law. But we see that sides are taken on many occasions where the woman who has come into the family is never seen as good enough. And they try to mm -hmm. um, make her even if she's from the Asian community, she might be a Sikh revert, revert, a Hindu revert, they try to make her more Pakistani and South Asian, which she will never be able to live up to, and subservient to the mother. The man, mm -hmm. let's forget about going about the family thing, the man is of, often ostracized and rejected, as are his children, especially if he comes from the black community and the term harami was something that I learned when and, and what it meant, what, it, what yeah. it meant, meaning that your children who are not fully South Asian are not, they come from your convert loins, are actually bastards, despite the fact that you married according to Islam. So my question to you, one of yeah. my many questions, is please explain this conundrum that we as converts face in that I, I think, yeah. I think, like, if we can just go a little bit wider from um, your 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 image that you showed there before, Dr. Abdul Haq, around the the uh, study and the the PhD that you've done on. This is a part of your PhD that you did on, mashallah. Um, so there's this idea that we come in kind of this founding founding kind of stage and move into the youth stage, and I think what happens is we. It's kind of a, a if you if you flip that on the other side, right, where you graduate not towards becoming one who has ihsan uh, and and becomes a mosin, right, sister or brother, but uh, but instead you become um, you kind of revert, regress back to this kind of cultural. Uh, version of that on the other side of that spectrum, if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm. So we, we begin here. We have this kind of beauty inside us where, yeah, we've got this uh, ideal kind of perspective. We're going to change the world. We're going to do great things. And then we kind of progress in that direction. But in the similar way, there's kind of a, a regression in that way. And I think a lot of, um, so for example, when I was finding my own faith, a lot of it was to do with the not necessarily the dichotomy but the contradiction of what my dean said and what we were supposed to do so for example and i know we talked about this during ramadan as well is that you know um so the the, the imam will talk about things that are haram uh um coming from a a, a, a sort of a an area near kotli uh, mirpur in kashmir so we have a certain dialect but usually it's urdu that they speak here um, it, it, when the khutbah is done anyway so the the conversations about things that are haram and this group is bad and that group is bad and yet most of the contributions that are coming in are through uh, people who are selling selling haram like you said you know uh, but in the true form of it that they're selling alcohol and all the rest of it but there's justifications for it and then it goes into that kind of out of the idealistic kind of phase and they become to justify it through these kind of things. And what it ends up is, is that the culture washes over and dilutes the facts that are in front of us. Yeah. 
and like you said, you know, we can look at things like you, you, you've touched on. You'll be embraced. You'll be like, oh, mashallah, look, brothers become Muslim. Sisters become Muslim. This is fantastic. This is how the Ummah is, how the Prophet ﷺ embraced everybody. All of these sort of things get said. But when you start to unpick away, when you go behind that tip of the iceberg, when you go a little bit deeper, those values and those beliefs uh, become apparent. And that apparentness is that it is not aligned with the truth and the reality of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained to us. So I think there's this kind of spectrum that we move across, right? Like a, like a, 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 a dial moving bounce backwards and forwards. And there's a huge cultural thing, like you said, you know, you know, and I was talking to somebody the other day and it just was saying like, look, you know, when, when a, a, um, an Asian woman got married into a family, she knew what that mother-in-law was like, etc., etc., etc. But inevitably, she becomes the mother-in-law. You know, she has a son, let's say, and she becomes that very same person who made her life hard for her. But not thinking about it or realizing and actualizing and sort of saying, I can make a shift on this, I can change on this. So I think there's a lot of underlying issues within uh, I'm talking about specifically my own Pakistani community that isn't looked at, that isn't dealt with, that, you know, whether we look at, like we've been talking about domestic violence, whether we talk about things around mental health issues, long-term illnesses, you know, uh, relationships, things that, you know, halal, haram businesses, you know, the right way to nurture society, helping our youngsters do X, you know, helping our sisters achieve Y, all of those sort of things. I think there's, there's huge uh, cracks in our whole landscape that keeps coming to the fore every time something challenges us because when that challenge comes to our doorstep that's when we realize what is our true value what is the true belief that we hold on to mm -hmm. even if it feels like hot coal in our hands i think that's very important what you've said and 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 that's something um i think i'm really pleased to hear that sort of um transparency Wajid in what you've said there because it's clearly as our um, viewers are highlighting it's culture versus or even over religion and what we've seen is that some have taken the culture and are calling it religion now so you'll see some converts I know convert sisters who came to the religion and uh, married Pakistanis or came amongst the Asian community and were told that they needed to wear shawakamis um, which is a, a South Asian dress. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but we, we, don't, we don't have to adopt a different culture. But as converts, what we are told is that, one, we don't have a culture, um, and two, if we subscribe to one, that it's rejected. So many of us, white and black converts, we come from a street culture that we have um, primarily shaped ourselves, which many of the South Asians... Somalis have adopted. They've adopted our street culture. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yet we're told we cannot hold on to that culture. And the important thing here is what then happens, and I'm not just going to point to the South Asian community, we've got individuals who are converts themselves, and they can see this rictus gap that's formed between converts and their former lives and communities and the Muslim communities. They can see the gap that's there. They can see the vulnerability that's there. And they, some of them are predators in themselves. And they will use some of the tactics that they used to womanize before they became Muslims. And they will bring it under a guise and premise that you're not accepted there, we understand you, we are your Muslim brothers, we're in the same boat. They will start using tactics of dating or approaching these women, saying, we are going to be with you anyway, um, so why not do some of the things that we're doing, sexting, um, uh, sharing illicit pictures, and even to an extent physical contact, so that particular sister in that instance, if, if, it's, if it's a convert, is used to that way and approach pre-Islam from Jahiliya because she's come from that.
that it's now being modified. Or it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's prevalent in our in Yeah, our it's society. been modified. So, yes, it's been modified because the words of Islam are being used to dress up that very uh, insidious design upon the sister. And if they don't do a nikah with a best friend who says, yeah, come on, I'll be the wakil, the wali, and marry them together, and, and she's all idealistic at that particular stage, then fornication, um, illicit sexual intercourse and relationships are done prior to that ceremony. And if the ceremony is done, it's a legitimate nikah, but the designs of that man on the woman is just to have halal sex. That's not her design. She thinks this is a marriage. He's dedicated to me, all of the words and everything that he said before. So sisters fall into that gap. And that includes Muslim sisters from South Asian communities, Arab communities. And then they have a huge issue where if the mother knows, the father finds out, do they have this illegitimate child or do they abort the child? And as you saw from the video that I showed you, there are mm. sisters having to go seeking abortions because of the pressure from the family, the shame of the community, not to mention the psychological effect that must have on them from these individuals who have used the deen, used the religion to basically um, attract this woman with promises of marriage and deen and using Allah's words and everything. And we've got to be careful because we know that if we go back to the beginning of time, we know that Iblis swore by Allah to Adam and Hawa. He swore by Allah that he was a sincere advisor he used Allah's name. So Iblis did that and was Rajim, cast out. And we've got, remember, we, we hear this in Surah to Nas, the, the last um, Surah, that we have shayateen among jinn and men. And I would dare say, I would dare offer that some of these individuals behaving in this way are from among those categories. Astaghfirullah. I think, like, sorry, just, uh, sister, sister Amal, salam alaikum, uh, sister Shabnam as well, you said salam before. I think it's this idea, what you kind of said there, that we we allow the halalifying of haram things, right? So, you know, we kind of say, well, you know what, and we, we justify it. You know, oh, well, if this happened and that happened, we bring all these spurious kind of links, connections, weak kind of, uh, logic, you know, warp logic out of context to, to explain things. But I think the, the main problem we're having as a, as a society and as a community is, you know, the hadith of the, the people who are on the boat and the people at the bottom don't want to bother the people at the top. So they drill a hole in the bottom of the boat to get the water in. So mm -hmm. they've got water. Uh, and so, and it, it, we're in, I feel we're very much in that kind of, of, society and community right now where we are kind of lost and like you said somebody comes into this deen because one of the things about culture is you don't recognize your own culture because you're in it but when somebody from external looks at your culture and says why, why do you do this why do you wear shawaki what's that all about and then you're like well yeah it's just something we do as muslims it's something you do as people from this part of the world yeah but it's not something you do as muslims so it's this idea of understanding what our culture actually is and what the richness of it is that informs us and makes us better people, but not allowing that part of those culture that start to infect and take us away from what our deen is actually about. And I think that's where, that's where we see that conflict. And, you know, like you, you meet people from different, pe different backgrounds, all the rest of it. And you can always tell somebody who's, who's well-read, self-aware, you know, when you talk to them, that they are aware of their culture and what it means, where the root of it comes from. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. There's a, there's, a, there's a guy I know, he's a Nigerian. He's a, he's a Nigerian uh, preacher. And uh, he told us this story um, where in Nigeria, what happens is uh, when somebody gets stuck, so they go, isabe, isabe, and people come, and everybody comes and helps, right? So let's say there's a car stuck in a mud track. Uh, it, like it usually slips off the road. They'll shout, Isabe, Isabe. People will come from all over 
and they'll pull this thing out. Now, he, he's a poet, and we were performing many years ago, and he told me where that comes from. And he said it was when the British were there in Nigeria, and they used to call the black people. And what they used to say was, apes obey, apes obey, as in apes as in monkeys, right? Apes obey, apes obey, right? Like, come, get here now. And they would all come to help because they'd, you know, they'd get whipped and all the rest of it. And that word has changed slightly. But he said, even now today, people are using that. And every time I hear that, as a man from that country, when he hears his own countrymen saying that, it cuts him up inside because he knows the root of it and where it's come from. But from a cultural perspective, there's no awareness of where it's come from. It's just something that they do. Because he was trying to find the root of this word. He's like, it doesn't sound like any other Nigerian word. It doesn't have any link to help or anything like this. So I think what happens is we kind of get ingrained in these kind of, and I'm using something that isn't part of my own culture. I've got plenty of flaws in my own. So, but I'm just giving it as an example of something that right. is an abstract idea. When I look at it, I think, subhanAllah, like this is so strange, right? But similarly, there are elements of my own culture that you could highlight, other viewers, listeners, friends could highlight and say, why do you do this? And I don't have an answer for it, you know? Uh, and I think in some ways when, you know, when I went to school, um, you know, uh, being in a school full of English people, you know, how come you don't know when your Eid is? Well, I, don't, I don't know when my Eid is, you know, <laughs> because I, I'm waiting for the moon. Well, why do you have to wait for the moon? I don't know why I'm waiting for the moon, you know? So it's like... <laughs> You know, like these things, we don't understand them until we kind of really think and pull them apart. But we don't think about them because until somebody from outside of our culture says, why, why are you doing this? What, where does this come from? Where's the value in this? How is this something that your Lord has asked you to do? And I think we're not getting enough of that because we're, we're insular in some ways because we had to be from a protective environment, right? When the, you know, when the elders came in the 50s, 60s, 70s, they were, you know, like no blacks, no Irish, no dogs, no Asians. You know, you had to live in a certain area. You know, you moved into a certain area and the, the indigenous community all moved out. You know what they call white flight. All of that sort of stuff would happen. So it, it was something that was done in order to, to protect yourself in numbers to be there in that way. But I right. think we've become a bit too insular in that way now where we've lost touch with kind of outside of those ivory bubbles. And there has to be a reconnection. Of, of, of ourselves as, as, as people as, yes. as, and, and that way to reconnect with each other inshallah and I think that some of the comments that are coming in I think are excellent in that yeah be, being a convert if the child was half British or half, uh, half white half black um, whatever went wrong with that child was blamed on their genes but then when we look at what's happening amongst the, the um, Muslim communities now they're, they're doing and perpetrating acts that are far worse than those that um, came into the religion or were descendants of converts and, and stuff. My thing is that one of the main things that we're seeing today is the um, misogyny. And the misogyny mm. and patriarchy, patriarchy is one thing, and we understand that in societal um, constructs, but misogyny is being taken as a norm and the abuse that we're seeing that's been metered to women. And was I misogynistic? Did I, did I or do I have aspects or characteristics of misogyny? I'm sure I did more than thinking that it was religion, um, but realizing as I grew that no, this was a, 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 wasn't actually religion and that I wasn't like that pre-Islam, okay? We see um, feminism on the rise and we see, uh, uh, and I'm saying an aggressive, extreme form of feminism and we see muslim sisters embracing that form of feminism as a to counteract the misogyny that we're seeing not only in wider society but more so in a concentrated microcosmic um, um form amongst the muslims the way that wives are being treated the way and expectations that some have upon their daughters and this is a problem in that this norm has opened up abuse on unprecedented scales of women. Unprecedented scales. And yet we see, despite that, the majority of those embracing the religion are women because of the mm. freedom that Islam gives. 
I've heard over the past few weeks since we started talking in this sort of vein and in, in this sort of um, on this sort of topic, many who have thought of giving up the religion when they saw what or how women were treated. And so we have to, and, and, and amongst the South Asian community, amongst the Arab community, amongst the predominant Muslim communities, this misogyny, let's be clear, because what happens is there's usually a kickback from brothers now, like he's calling it misogyny, Allah says this in the Quran, there's this hadith that says mm -hmm. that, and, and such like. What, what are the context of what have been said? And then let's look at our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Which mm -hmm. one, which man, which woman will dare say he was misogynist? None. So mm -hmm. how then are we using abstracts of the faith out of context to say that yeah. we can treat women in the way that we're doing? And it's nothing other or tantamount to abuse. Yeah. But why do yeah. we have to check ourselves to ask, have we had or displayed those particular characteristics beforehand? If we have, we need to change it. If we haven't, we need yeah. to speak out against it. Because there's this culture yeah. where men, where brothers remain silent. There are cases where there's been abuse um, in family um, situations where we've seen incest. And because it's the head of the household, the family have remained silent. The men and the women in these instances. Yeah. And I think the other thing that you've, you've sort of touched on there, and astaghfirullah, yeah, definitely I have a lot to, to do to improve myself. But um, alongside that, not but, but alongside that, um, what we see is, like you said, the sister goes, you know, she's, she's, she gets pregnant and then the guy leaves her. The, the guy is not held to account. There's no accountability for the men in the same way that there is for the women. So this dishonor is brought on by the women, but the man's action has brought no dishonor, uh, like you said, upon the family or otherwise. It's like the, the problem has been created by the men, the women are, are going to go and sort it out. And I think there's this, there's this, that, yeah, the misogyny is there. It's definitely there. I, I have to come back and say this, because those men who are not confronting it and who are keeping silence with it are as uh, culpable as those are doing it. And I repeat again, those brothers who, from my community and others who stand up against it, it's time to rise again now. It's time to rise again. It's time to confront those converts who are coming in and manipulating, exploiting and abusing what they see is a gap between the more cultural Muslim communities and those of us and those of our children and those sisters who are converting and leaving those particular um, non-Muslim communities. Also, those, those women who are from Muslim backgrounds, South Asians, Arabs and the like, Africans, those who are born Muslim um, and raised in Muslim households, being enticed by Muslim, um, uh, established Muslims and convert Muslims and deflowering them, let's use this term, deflowering them, defiling them, disgracing them, dishonoring them. It's time they started being called out once again, like in the 90s and the early noughties and confronted. It's time they were taken to task. It's time for the silence to end and it's time for this discussion to be placed at the top of the agenda and addressed regularly. We all talk about Me Too. Me Too started 1400, 1500 years ago when the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, received the revelation and the women saw the liberation that Islam brought. That so-called Me Too, which happened recently in the Western world, that liberation came with the advent of Islam. So we now need to uphold that. And instead of the women being the sole clarion callers to that, there needs to be men. I'm no example, but there needs to be men who stand up and confront other brothers, fathers, husbands, 
it's not enough talking about it on these shows. Mm. Behind these scenes, and, and, it, needs to be, it needs to be taking place. And what needs to take place, they need to know that there's no space in any of the communities that they belong to or they move into when it's established that they're going in. And as we used to say in the 90s and the, the noughties, they are tasters. They go and taste. They taste here, they taste there, and they move on. And they leave children. And if they don't leave children, they leave destruction in their, their, their wake. And for converts who are doing this, they need to be called out and confronted. For converts who are being abused in this way, they need to be protected by these Muslim communities. Yeah, I think there was... Um... There was a message on just before I've gotten the sister's name will put it up, but this misogyny, you know, it comes from this idea of a of a village mentality. And I think um we've got, like I said there, is Hassan. So more often than not, the misogynistic behavior that is being passed on as legit has stemmed from a cultural village mentality. And this is the this is the reality that we're dealing with. And like you said, the the structures are there to support each other. And we see this, whether you look at, you know, those individuals in power who do the same thing or otherwise. It, it, and I'm not saying this to point the finger elsewhere because ultimately as Muslims, we, we have a higher standard and we need to maintain that standard. And like you said, for myself and for you, Dr. Abdul Haq, for ourselves, firstly, foremostly, and then to, to support where we can, inshallah. And the, the, the reality is that we, what what is it going to take for us to kind of wake up to that? Because ultimately, uh, similarly in the sense of you know when we look at the Black Lives Matter movement, the the impact is going to be when the white communities deal with that racism and do something about it in, in turn. And in a similar way, this misogyny is not going to be dealt with within our own communities until the men stand up and do something about it. Mm. And it, 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 that is what it's going to take to safeguard um, because ultimately, you know, uh, it, it might seem to be another woman. But that is, like I said, it's a cycle that we see over and over and over again. And if, you know, you have children, you have daughters, right? You've got sisters, right? This problem is on your doorstep. It might not be happening to your family right now, but it's going to arrive at your doorstep your daughters or your sisters or your wife is going to meet these sort of people that are going to have these sort of interactions. You're going to meet other girls, sisters, etc., that have, have, are going through this kind of stuff. And it's going to have an impact. It's going to come into your home. And ultimately, like you said, you know, as Muslims, we have a responsibility and accountability from ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we need to uphold ourselves to a higher standard, that when we see these sort of things on the news, we have to ask ourselves, astaghfirullah, that this thing is happening in our community. Why are we not so outraged, disgusted, and um, you know, short of dragging people through the streets by the, the, the scruffs of their neck, um, or not addressing and dealing with it appropriately uh, within, said, within the law of the land, interject. inshallah. No, you're yeah. right. And it's just, as you said, short of dragging them by their necks through the street. No, not short. They, we drag them through the streets by their necks, if that needs to be the case. That, 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 that's nothing compared to what they have done to these sisters. Mm -hmm. Dragging them through the streets. And I'm not talking about vigilantism, but what I'm saying is you meet like with like and then some. Our sisters, especially um, those who have come to the Dean, those young ones who have always been in the Dean and they're going out into the world ready to get married and then they get abused because there's some, some uh, the Quran and the Dean and the Sunnah is used as some ruse to basically defile and deflower them. So if they want to be doing that, I'll just say straight, be, be prepared for the consequences once you've been exposed, once it's been established. Okay, as we said in last week's show, we can't always um, listen to those who cry wolf, but um, it's not often that they cry wolf. It's a minority of cases, of, as we see, where, where the, that's the case. But what we are seeing and the silence that goes with it because of the misogynistic culture that, goes, that, that is there. Mothers who have South Asian sons 
your mother, other mothers, stop enabling your sons and bringing them up like they're some sort of, um, on some pedestal where when the woman comes in to the family home or is married, she's just not good enough because the mother doesn't hold her to be good enough. And then you try to make her become you or the ideal woman that you wanted her to become as a South Asian, as an Arab, as an as a, a original African and Muslim. And she's never going to achieve that status or that criteria. And so the son sees the disappointment, detects the disappointment of the mother with the daughter, with, he, with the, the daughter-in-law, with his wife. And because he's been in, enabled so much to the mother, with the mother, he starts treating her in a particular sense as well, as though she's just a housemaid or a slave. She cannot do anything. She cannot defend herself. She has no one to defend her. She's just not good enough. Mm. How is that taking place? And those sisters who are mothers and have daughter, um, sons, and you're treating your sons in that particular instance, that young lady who's come from another lifestyle, who has given up what she had before, don't think that, oh, she yeah. was living the life as a, as a prostitute and didn't have anyone there. She had a network. She had a family network. She had brothers. She had people who loved her. And because she decided to cover her head and cover her body and worship Allah, she's often ostracized. Sisters, brothers and fathers who see men come into the deen and give up what they've given up before. And they're ostracized or seen as traitors. And they want to have a sense of belonging. Yet you treat them, you treat us as outsiders. Where do you think we're going to go? Let me say, some, some went into radicalization and extremism. Some went in that direction. Some have abandoned the religion. Some are in the religion, broken with psychological problems, alone. So, being between cultures affects everyone. Those traditionally Muslim and those who have embraced the faith. And in between these two entities, there is a vacuum and there are those lurking in that vacuum to exploit. And some of the stories that I have heard in the past few weeks compared to some of the horror stories that I saw and was involved in as chairman of Brixton Mosque, not from that community necessarily, because we had to travel around the, cu the country, but there are things I can tell you that you and me keep our heads short because we're losing our hair or whatever, but it will make our hair stand back on end. You might even grow an afro if I was to tell you some of the things that, um, mm. uh, that I've seen. And it cannot happen and the silence cannot continue and yeah there will be brothers as i've said they're gonna there's going to be a whole plethora of men who are against what we're saying here now because that's what happens mm -hmm. the men close ranks the brothers close ranks i'm here to say no matter if you close ranks we're gonna kick them uh, wide open we're gonna kick yeah. them wide open whether it's one two three of us they're gonna be kicked right open because why? Why will they be kicked right open? Because you don't have Dean on your side, and we do. Mm. So those brothers who are watching and witnessing and being mute about what they're seeing taking place, those brothers who are being overnight walis to a sister to marry them off to their friend or their brother, beware. Beware. Yeah, Allah. And it's you know, it's it's not even that. I mean, like I said, we see uh, perpetrators um, getting away with it. You know, whether it does go through the laws and things like that, you know, the courts and things like that. But surely, you know, as as Muslims, what is it that we're not doing right that we don't recognize that Allah is seeing what we do? Allah, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from it. I mean, is 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 it, it shakes you to your core, you know. I mean, you know, you 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 do something wrong. I mean, sometimes you cut somebody off in traffic, and it still bothers you twenty minutes later. But you're talking about devastating somebody's whole life. I mean, that that that's a huge impact. That's not going away. You know, they're not scars. They're 
the, the you know the, the pit that have been dug out of individual souls that's really going to um, to change things in, in such a huge way. You know, uh, Sister Sabrina, Jazakal Khair for your comment. She said that I always thought that the adults, how uh, who are looking for love in in another stranger man or woman, is due to the fact that they didn't get enough love from their own family, maybe parents, brothers and sisters. Now there, yeah, there's there's some truth in that in the sense of where people look for, but also, but the other thing I'd also add to that, Sister Sabrina, and uh, Dr. Abdul Haq touched on it, is that when you embrace Islam, when you come into this deen, you come into kind of this family, this family of of, of the Ummah, as it were, you know, this this family of believers, that you all are are one in that sense, that you're all, you know, uh, in the sight of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and you've come into this, you've come into this fold. And so you connected and joined in. And that family is like uh, Dr. Abdul Haq is talking about, is what is rejecting you, what is squeezing you back out, is what is saying, yes, you're in the fold, but you have to stay in that little crease over there. Don't come any further out from that. And I think there's a lot of that that has to be, that has to be unraveled. And there's a lot of introspection that's going to be required from the ummah. And it's going to require that delving and opening up and that opening up is going to show a lot of wounds, a lot of difficulties, a lot of self-learning and self-awareness or, or and recognizing of, of mistakes and, and wrongs. But the point being that ultimately resolve it here, resolve it in this dunya, because in the next dunya, it's, it's a heavy, heavy resolution. It's a heavy, and, heavy pride. And that, that, that's, very know, too, too, that's very true, Wajid. And what we're seeing, there is a lack of fear in that instance. So what needs to be done, a type of fear needs to be present and prevalent in this life. And pre prior to Islam, if our sister or um, someone was harmed, okay, was harmed by um, a, a boyfriend or a husband or whatever, Let's just speak straight. He got dealt with. We don't call 999. He might. But we don't do that. So we come to the deen. We're within Islam. We give each other platitudes. Fear Allah. This is haram. Itakila. And the brothers know that that's as far as you're going to go. No, it's not. There's some of us... Mm -hmm who will go back to how it used to be before. And, frankly, that individual will be dealt with. Interpret that as you will. But that doesn't mean, dealt with doesn't mean we're going to sit down and have marshmallows by the fire and sing Kumbaya. Mm. Dealt with means exactly as you understand it to mean like it used to be before some of us became Muslims. Yeah. And... If that's the fear that needs to be instilled in an individual upon him wedding a sister, so be it. Some will say, oh, Abdu'l-Haq, thuggery, not right, shouldn't say that. I've said that last week. If someone can give me an alternative in the Western context that we're living in, if someone can give me an alternative, I'm willing to hear it. Being a Muslim of 30 mm. years, I have not seen an alternative in the West except this being held over individuals' heads. Mm. Whether the sister has got a Muslim yeah, brother it's, it's a or non-Muslim brother, yeah. when they're getting married, yeah. when they're getting married and brothers are saying, yeah, my bro, congratulations and everything like that. And the community she's coming from, if she's a convert and everything, say, but brother, treat her right treat her right because if she's harmed she's got a whole lot of people here who are going to back her and support mm -hmm. her and she needs to know that because what happens and some of us do it psychologically as well when we see that that muslim convert does not have extended family subconsciously we if we may take advantage of that because we know, as we say on, in street vernacular, she doesn't have backup. Mm. And everything back in the day before Islam 
was about backup. And if you want to look at, in Islam, about tribes and families and everything like that, you still have that. Before Islam, you make a phone call and you can call, as they say in today's language, a squad, 50, 100 deep, who would be there in 15 minutes. Sisters who converted to the deen, some of them had that. So, for example, my sister... Alhamdulillah is Muslim. Mm. If she had an issue and she made a phone call to me, I would make a phone call and you would see a caravan of cars at the scene, ready to do whatever needs to be done. But now, brothers, oh, we're brothers, we can't do that. Advise the brother, advise the brother. And he knows that's the full extent of what's going to happen. And even those brothers who come from tradi traditional backgrounds who marry converts, they need to know, don't care who your traditional background is and how many Muslim family you've got and everything. If you're going to mis um, abuse this particular sister and treat her as lesser than a Muslim or lesser than equal because she's a convert, her backup, Muslims, hopefully, and to some degree, non-Muslims who don't want to see their new convert um, sister being treated this way, are going to show up. And if it means that there's going to be some serious issues that spill off from this, so be it. Because they won't be as serious as the abuse, neglect, harm that is continuing to be done to these sisters who are broken. Who are broken and being broken and we know about it and we're hearing too many stories about it and we shake our heads and we do a show like this and then we come off it and we leave it no 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 there are brothers on the ground who are not leaving it but i appeal to those brothers to revive what we used to do and how we used to be in the 90s and bring it up to speed as we approach 2021 because there are individuals doing this on, and they're being caught on social media and they, they, they don't care. They don't care. But we will help you to care. Mm. I think the other thing, uh, Dr. Abdul Haq, is, is to bring this to, um, to an awareness because, like you said, it may sound a bit full on, but I think if any of the the brothers who are tuned in this evening and anybody who's who's watching this replay um when you speak or hear firsthand of a story of a sister in this particular way then you will understand why it's it's not a challenge to feel such emotions within oneself to feel this anger because you're calling yourself Muslim and the behavior is like this. You know, there's a whole host of different things. And since we've, like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, uh, over the last two weeks, a lot of people have been in touch with, uh, directly with uh, Dr. Abdul Haq to discuss the difficulty of their situation. And the reason why, alhamdulillah, that they have done that, and I say alhamdulillah, is they've done that, is they've, they've realized that they've got back up, yeah? And they need to have that back up so they can straighten things out as they need to be, so they can get on with the way, their lives with the way they want to be able to get on with their lives. And it's, it's that context, I just want to add um, to all of that in that being said, that when you see it, it will pull on your heartstrings uh, Online, not even pulling your heartstrings, it crushes you inside, it crushes you, it crushes all your organs inside, like this. And then you realize, stuff a lot that this is the this is the reality that some sisters are on a loop every single day of their lives. And then you will understand that there's a reason why this needs to be spoken out against that no one is above the law, firstly and foremostly. And that ultimately, you know, you will be held to account. You will be held to account. So 
astaghfirullah al-adeem that we we remain uh, steadfast upon holding true to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what's important to add to that, um, Brother Wajid, is that, and I want sisters to know this, and brothers, it's only a phone call away. Help in, in a lot of instances if you knew, but also what we've got to understand is this, that one phone call away where the help will come, that can be the end of the beginning of your problem, the end of the beginning. If there's a sustainability of support around that sister. I spoke a few weeks ago about, mashallah, my ex-wife, uh, Allah Mubarak, when we used, our doors were open. Two sisters that would contact her, they wouldn't know her. And they said, we heard um, you help, your husband helps. And they would travel from different parts of the country. I've come home from work and oh, the, in the spare room, there's a sister there, this is the situation. Do we do that now? Mm. And, and when those sisters come, they're actually safe. They're not going into another thing where the, the man in that house is going to take advantage. They are safe for the moment. They are safe. And then they're not told, oh, you've been here long enough. You need to go back home now. And you know that you will never hear from them again because it will be suppressed. How many of us are doing that? That's a lot, yeah. When we've got guests coming round, we go and do a shop, we get the best food in, the best drinks, and we entertain them, we want to, them to be the most comfortable. That's all, that's really easy to do. And then we say, alhamdulillah, barakah for what we're doing. But I dare say, there's barakah, there's blessings in that, but I dare say the blessings to help someone in need who's in a situation, we're hearing on this lockdown that domestic violence and domestic abuse has increased. Let me say this clearly. That's about the cases that are reported. And that's highly likely about yeah. the cases that are non-Muslim, because we know in the culture of the Muslims, they're not going to speak about it. So if we want to add yeah. the likelihood of the violence and domestic abuse that's taken place amongst Muslim households, and they were to speak, yeah. I, I wonder how much the numbers would ex increase exponentially if that's the case. I hope I'm wrong, but we're talking about reality yeah. now. How many of that is unreported? How underreported are those statistics in that particular instance? So sometimes, sometimes we have to open our doors and we've got to say, okay, this is uncomfortable. It's causing an inconvenience for us, but it's causing a convenience for that sister who's already been inconvenienced because of what she's been enduring. And then it doesn't just stop there, keeping that door open, the door open to let somebody come in. Then we need to gather individuals and we need to call the individual, the brother or the perpetrator or the predator and say, can we talk about this? And if he wants to be wrong and strong, and if he wants to start railing up, then he needs to know, we'll meet you with that. We'll meet you with that, on that plane, on that playing field. Because you are wrong. You are wrong. Mm. And your wrong will never turn into a right. It cannot be right that we have evidence that this is how this woman has been treated. This is how this woman has been abused. This is how these women have been married, impregnated, and you've continued moving on. And let me say this as well. Brothers who have sisters, convert brothers who are wakil for sisters, investigate the people who are coming and asking for marriage. Investigate them thoroughly. Rile them dig deep, shake them, anger them, so you can get an inclination of what that type of person that individual is. And if they've masked it very, very well, let them know that if the true colours come out after marriage, you're going to be on their case. Oh, yeah. Their space will be shut down. Yeah. Effort is needed in this. Work is needed in this. There's yeah. no... There's no mm. alternative. Again, I, I put this out. I, I'm, putting, I'm putting out an appeal. I'm putting out an appeal. If there is another way or other alternatives to the solutions that I am familiar with, please share them and show the evidence of how effective they are and we will adopt them. Mm. And I think, again... It's it's highlighting that that it is a collective effort, 
it is a collective effort upon each one of us to do the right thing. Full stop. That's what it is. But um, the sister Shama there saying, um, so much undoing to raise a better, more God-fearing generation of men. Yes. Uh, and, and if we start now, inshallah, hopefully, by the time we get to the next generation, uh, we'll have made a lot of progress. We'll have made it to the to the next level, which is sincerely needed. Jazakallah khair, sister Shamma. There's a lot of sisters uh, and brothers who sort of give salams. Sorry if we've missed you. Uh, Jasmine, Aya, Sharon, uh, Kane, Night Ranger, Amal, uh, Shabnam, uh, Fatima, Khadija, uh, Lala Rook. So, wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, inshallah. Um, I just want to, uh, we've run over a bit there. So I think we're we're going to close here, but we are going to continue this discussion, inshallah, um, whichever way it goes, inshallah ta'ala. So um, again, jazakallah khair for all of you tuning in. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution. The comments have been uh, fantastic, really. And what I mean by fantastic is that engaging, we understand that, uh, you know, what the subject matter we're putting out to you and you're connecting with that and you're really you're being, you know, um, open and transparent with this as well. So Jazakallah khair. And um, this this subject isn't something that is to be uh, skirted around. It's it's a reality. And like Dr. Abdul Haq says, you know, we, me and him are going to turn the cameras off and, and you know, we're, 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 we're going to sleep well, reasonably well tonight, yeah? You know, alhamdulillah, there's none of that uh, other stuff I- in our mind, but there are um, sisters who are not going to be able to sleep in, in such a peaceful way and not due to anything that is out of their control, but is due to out of a form of oppression that is brought to them by the very person who is supposed to be there, who is supposed to be a a cover for them, who's supposed to be a garment for them, who's supposed to be a shield for them, and who's supposed to honor them. So um, I just want to say Jazakallah uh, khair for all of your comments. Thank you. It, 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 there's a lot going on there. Uh, salam Lopez, uh, Salam Sister Amal and Aya, and Jazakallah khair. And thank you all for your comments, inshallah. And we will continue this discussion, inshallah. Thank you very much, Sister Jasmine and Sabrina. Uh, there's so many of you getting involved. Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much. Uh, please keep your comments coming in. And inshallah ta'ala, we will join you inshallah uh, next Monday, uh, same time again inshallah. Hopefully no technical issues and I will be on time. So my apologies again sincerely for the tardiness today. Uh, but I will say that uh, Dr. Abdul Haq, if you want to give us any closing comments before we go. I would just say that for, to everyone to really think about the next person, the, the sister, the brother, um, Help your brother, whether he's depressed or the oppressor, okay? In that instance, if he's oppressing, then he needs to be confronted and you are actually helping him. If, uh, if, the, if, the, if, he's being, if she or he's being oppressed, you need to step in. There's an imbalance if we are not standing up against injustice, especially when it's close by and it's within mm. our communities. And... As I said a few weeks before, woe to you who keep silent on this. Woe to you who are letting this happen. Woe to you who know this is taking place and are just turning a blind eye to it. And to those of you who are participating in it, a big warning for the, for yeah. this life and the hereafter, especially the hereafter. Because if you're not caught in this life, you will be caught in the hereafter by one whose grip and seizure is unescapable, inescapable. But if you get caught in this life and there are brothers dedicated to making sure that such abuse doesn't happen, help is close at hand from those brothers. You will be seen and visited shortly. You will be highlighted, outed, whatever, very shortly. And then you can be wrong and strong in the same way that you've been abusing women. You can attempt, you can attempt to be like that and be wrong and strong with these brothers, but you won't succeed. So sisters, please don't suffer in silence. Genuine grievances, please speak to someone, 
articulate it, let your voice come out. Because if you in internalize it, as I'm seeing, the mental strain is placed on sisters, on their religion, their faith, their psychological um, conditions. I, I, I share this with you, Wajid. I have had mm. a headache from this morning. And it's been dealing with this. I've dealt with this since just after Fajr. I've been dealing with cases all today, mm -hmm. up until five minutes before this show. And I'm say, I say now, I'm ready to do with it. I'm, I'm happy to help. I am happy to help because there needs to be more people involved. Again, I'll hasten to add, I'm not that perfect individual. Please do not think I am, oh, he's the perfect example. I'm as flawed as the next man. Not like that, inshallah, hopefully. But someone's got to step up. And there are many brothers there who are ready to step up if they know. So speak, sisters. Brothers, if you're too yeah. afraid to speak about others who are intimidating doing this, if it's happening to your own sister or a relative, speak to some other brothers. Pass the message to them. Inshallah. 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 And uh, just to... Sorry, Dr. Bhak. I, I was giving you the last word. Inshallah, Ta'ala. We'll continue. We'll continue next week, Inshallah. Uh, and thank you all again for tuning in. And uh, yeah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless his infinite mercy, his bounties, and his blessings upon you all. And may you all be in the best of iman and honor. May Allah remove all your hardships and your difficulties. May Allah grant you with ease. May Allah grant you with ease. May Allah grant you with ease. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us throughout us throughout these difficulties and may Allah give us clarity of thought, of iman and of action, inshallah, to be able to do the right thing that suffices us in this life and in the hereafter. Amen. And inshallah, we'll look forward to joining you, inshallah ta'ala, uh, next Monday. So, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh.